swashbucklers, you're listening to Under the Crossbones, episode number 139. My name is Phil Johnson. I'm your host for the show each and every week. Thank you for tuning in. Thanks for telling your friends and visiting sponsors and doing all that kind of good stuff that you do that helps me keep the old boat afloat. Much appreciated. So here we are, episode number 139. Fun fact about the number 139. In the year 139, Marcus Aurelius was named uh, Caesar of the Roman Empire. Uh, and if uh, if you're familiar with that name, then you are probably a uh, follower of Stoic philosophy at some point, uh, and or Tim Ferriss, <laughs> who loves to talk about Marcus Aurelius. Uh, my guest on the show today, this is a fun one, Dave Burgess is on the show today, and he is the creator of Teach Like a Pirate. And uh, this is a, we're going a little bit off course here. This is a little bit different from what we usually talk about here. But I like to talk with people who are doing interesting things with the the mythos of pirates, the iconography of pirates, and, and looking at how people are adapting the idea of pirates into modern day life. And that's what this is about today. Uh, Dave's got a program called Teach Like a Pirate. Uh, so if you're in education at all, uh, this is a very, uh, it, it, you'll get a lot out of this. There's lots of cool stuff in here. Uh, and if you're not in education, then this will give you some good insight into what educators go through uh, in trying to deal with uh, children and anybody that's trying to learn anything and how to make that experience more interesting uh, and and better than it currently is. I mean, I'm sure there's, I know I've talked to a lot of people on the show and a lot of people who listen to the show who took history class in high school and was a drag, man. He had dates and names and blah, blah, blah. And then afterward discovered that history is a really interesting subject. Or that could be anything else, language or or uh, social studies or math or science or, you know, any of that kind of stuff, uh, if taught correctly, can be very, very interesting. And uh, so we're going to talk to Dave Burgess about that today, and it's a, it's a fun talk. I think you'll have a good time with it. I, uh, I've been doing, I uh, did lots of shows last week. The shows were good. Uh, the shows were, um, here's the phase I'm in right now. I've got my new hour of material uh, that's that's uh, almost ready to be filmed for my next comedy special. And uh, I'm in the editing phase right now, which is just going through and going, well, you know, that joke has never worked. I should probably replace it with a joke that actually works. And so it's going through all the stuff that I've been writing over the last couple of years and just tweaking it, changing the wording and taking jokes out and putting some new jokes in. So that was what I spent most of the last week doing uh, on stage was uh, was trying out the new tweaked versions of things. And some things worked and some things didn't work. Uh, and it was, uh, it was uh, good work, good work done all the way around. Now, as to when that comedy special will be filmed... Ah, oh, boy, I should probably start planning that. I, it's 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 a huge project, and uh, and it takes months to put together. And I always just go, oh boy, when am I going to find the time to actually put that together? But it will. Uh, it. I'm hoping this year. I'm really hoping for this year uh, that I can uh, that I can get that accomplished. But in the meantime, there's more shows to be had. Uh, May the 9th, I'll be at the Milk Bar in San Francisco, California, doing a battle of the musical comedy bands. Uh, so that'll be interesting. It's all musical comedy that night. May 11th, I'll be at Comedy Oakland in Oakland, California. May 12th, uh, critical hit at It's Your Move in Oakland, California. That's a game store, nerds. Yeah, get out there for that one. It's a fun show. Uh, May 24th. Uh, Spring Lake Holiday Inn in Spring Lake, Michigan. Coming out to Michigan area. Uh, May 26th, Coral Gables in Saugatuck, Michigan. 527, uh, Woody's Press Box, Wyoming, Michigan. May 29, I'll be at Zany's in Rosemont, Illinois, just outside of Chicago. Love that club. That is one of my favorite places in the country to play. So uh, that's May 29 at Zany's in Rosemont. And May 31st, Quadden Casino, Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. So, uh, so happy to be out there in the spring this time. Usually I end up in that part of the country in the dead of winter. And this time, there will be no snow. And if there's snow at the end of May, then we have bigger problems than me having to drive through snow. So anyway, you can catch all those tour dates. Go to underthecrossbones.com. Click on the tour dates button. You can see where I'm coming near you uh, to tell jokes and sing songs. It's going to be fun. Uh, just, hey, if you want to plan for way out, for way out next year, uh, I will be at the Fort Myers Pirate Festival. It's the first weekend of October. I will be at the Laugh-In Comedy Cafe uh, in Fort Myers that weekend. That is the October of 2019. Yes, I just booked twenty October of 2019 for that club. 
So you can put that on your calendar whenever you get a 2019 calendar. But there's earlier Pirate Fest stuff coming up. Uh, the NorCal Pirate Fest is coming up. That's June 16 to 17. That's that's my home festival here in the Bay Area. And I discovered I am booked for shows all that weekend. But I'm going to try and get there on Sunday the 17th for half a day before I go do a gig in Reading that night. So if you happen to be going to the NorCal Pirate Festival and you see me around uh, with the long hair, I'll probably be wearing a red shirt or something, uh, stop by, say hi. Uh, I'll be wandering around, not doing anything official at that one, but just say hi if you see me. Uh, Long Beach Pirate Invasion, July uh, June 30th to July 1st. I will definitely be there, and I will be doing things in an official capacity on a stage uh, with a microphone, doing some MC stuff and things like that. I will be uh, doing tons of interviews during that event. Uh, so if you see me around at the Long Beach Pirate Invasion, June 30 to July 1st, come by, say hi, uh, and uh, and we'll uh, we'll chat. So uh, have you seen the Avengers yet? Uh, it's everybody, I think everybody saw it before we did. Uh, my girl and I, we went and saw it yesterday. And she's the she's the superhero buff in the in the family. I I can take it or leave it, but we always go uh, for the eye candy, and you just go, hey, look, things blown up and stuff happening. And uh, anyway, if you haven't seen it yet, I won't spoil it. Uh, the ending is not an ending that anybody's satisfied with, apparently. But it's like think of it like Empire Strikes Back. It's the middle of a larger story that's happening, and it was just weird to see the energy in the theater when it ended everybody was just kind of not you there was no applause there was no excitement everybody in the theater was just kind of like oh well all right guess guess that's how that part's gonna end and then they just all sort of filed out it was like a very strange ending after a three-hour movie experience it's too long it's too long tell your story in an hour and a half please filmmakers people gotta pee ridiculous these long movies are just i know we're paying a lot for the movie tickets but still three hours is too long for anything nobody should have to sit in one seat for that long i'm not good at sitting in one seat for that long that's just me maybe so hey uh are you interested in learning to play the guitar i'll bet you are everybody wants to learn how to play the guitar because it's a cool instrument and i've been a guitar teacher for a long long time now and i have a program now that you can do without me sitting in front of you uh which is fantastic and there's a free way that you can get involved with it it's called the 30 day guitar challenge and it will take you from zero from i've never played a guitar before to learning your first three songs in 30 days with just 10 minutes a day of practice that's the key 10 minutes a day if you can you can't you can any everybody can squeeze in 10 minutes a day if i could figure out how to film my comedy special in just 10 minutes a day of preparation between now and then that would be great but it takes longer than that but you can learn how to play the guitar in 10 minutes a day so here's how you do this uh go to under the crossbones.com slash guitar that will take you to the sign up form it is free to get involved it is 30 days of guitar lessons from me to you and uh and it'll, you'll learn three songs in 30 days it's a whole bunch of fun everybody's been enjoying it and uh and that's it so go to under the crossbones.com slash guitar to check that out if you're enjoying the show and i hope you are come join us over on facebook.com slash under the crossbones on twitter we're at under crossbones no the in that one and of course you can get all the show notes and subscribe to the show at under the crossbones.com slash 139 for this episode and do make sure you're subscribed if you're listening uh, through something that you're not subscribed from, whether just on the website or or on Pirate Radio or somewhere, uh, just head over to the website, click the subscribe button, uh, and it'll show you how to subscribe with your podcast uh, th- app that you like. I use Podcast Addict or or the iTunes one or whatever you use, Apple Podcast. Ugh, sorry, Apple. It's not iTunes anymore. It's Apple Podcast. It's a thing with them. Uh, anyway, but anyway, <laughs> make sure you subscribe to the show. Then you get every new episode first thing in the morning, Tuesday morning when it comes out. And uh, and actually, if you're East Coast, you actually get it at nine o'clock Monday night because I put it out for midnight West Coast time. So anyway, you can get it early. You can be in there early. And like by the time I get out of bed Tuesday morning, you can be already like, I listened to it already. What's next? Um, <laughs> which is the thing I heard the guys from uh, Stranger Things, the guys that do Stranger Things were doing an interview. And they were talking about how they put out the entire season at once on Netflix, right? And so they said literally when they put out season two of Stranger Things, the next morning people were going, I've watched the whole thing. When's season three coming out? It's just, it's craziness. I, how could, I don't, I couldn't binge a whole season of anything that quickly. That's insane. All right. Anyway, so let's get to some teachings. We're not going to sit around just watching TV. We're going to learn some things today. And uh, we're going to have a good time, and we're going to learn about uh, how education can be done a little bit better um, by making it a little more piratey. So let's get into my discussion now with Dave Burgess uh, from Talk Like a Pirate. Dig it. 
teachlikeapirate.com. Tell me a little bit about what you do. Um, I've, I've read over your website and stuff, but explain to me what it is that you do as a teacher. Okay, so Teach Like a Pirate is a, it's a name, it's a brand that's confused a lot of people. And uh, well, we don't want teachers to attack and rob ships at sea. This is all about embracing, it's about the definition of a pirate, the spirit of a pirate. And, and to me, the, the spirit of a pirate is someone who is unconventional, someone who's willing to reject the status quo, someone who's willing to sail into uncharted waters with no guarantee of success, a risk taker, a rebel, a maverick. So it's about embracing that spirit of being a pirate. And then in addition to that, pirates, of course, are known for having hooks. And this is all about how you can add hooks into your classroom, into your content to draw students in almost magically or magnetically into what you're doing in your room. And then the other thing is that it's an acronym. So each one of the letters of, uh, you know, P-I-R-A-T-E is an acronym. Each one of those letters stands for something in the pirate system. Okay. What do they stand for? So the P stands for passion, the I, immersion, the R, rapport, the A is for ask and analyze, T, transformation, and the E stands for enthusiasm. Okay. So let's, let's dig back a little bit. And just to kind of give you a little bit of background into who you're talking to at the moment there, I have a lot of pirate fans and a lot of pirate history people, but I also have a lot of folks listening who do, um, education within the context of historical reenactment and things like that, who I think could get something out of our discussion today. Um, and and as a benefit side note, I'm a music teacher as well, so I will probably gain some benefit from this as well. Fantastic. <laughs> so let's go back. Where do you start as a teacher, and yeah. what what kind of uh, what kind of um, epiphany did you have that made you start teaching differently? Yeah, so I was a high school U.S. history teacher for 17 years uh, here okay. in San Diego, California. And during the process, I was, I was working with a tough group. So my group is made up of, uh, based, my students are made up of three groups. One were special education students who were being mainstreamed in their, into my classroom as their least restrictive environment. Two, students who were so, so difficult, so much of a behavior issue in their other classes, they were pulled out of that class in order for, to help the educational environment of the other students. And then in the wisdom of what we used to do is we would take all these students who were individually disruptive in their classes and we'd say, hey, why don't we put them together all in one room? And that would be my room, right? Okay. And then the third group of students, the students who were apathetic, they didn't want to be at school. Um, they were basically being forced to come to school. And they walked in with a chip on their shoulder, like saying like, and didn't mind you knowing they were basically being forced to come to school. Now, if you take those three groups, you mix them, mix them together. Those are my people. Those are the people that I love to teach. Those are the, the, those are the people that I specialize in teaching. And those are the students that teach like a pirate was specially designed for. I think it works with, the, with students across the whole spectrum, but it was specially designed working on the front lines of classes like that. And for me, it was a matter of survival. I was either going to find a way to engage these students or I was going to burn out and have to leave the profession. And so finding this way of teaching, which, which uh, I've branded as teaching like a pirate uh, was was a survival tactic for me, and then I began to travel and give workshops and seminars uh, around the world uh, to, t to teachers and teach them how to teach like a pirate. Eventually, writing a book that came out in 2012, which hit the educational New York Times bestseller list, uh, called "Teach Like a Pirate." And now we have, uh, you know, it's an entire publishing company that we run right here from our house. Um, over 44 different books, but uh, five or six of them are, are in the pirate brand. Okay. Yeah. So that is, a, it sounds like, a, first of all, a notoriously difficult group of students to teach. Not that they don't deserve to learn or don't want to learn even for that matter, but a notoriously difficult uh, crowd to engage uh, with a subject like history, which in the traditional teaching sense is often presented in a very boring way, uh, which again, there's no reason for it to be, but it was, I mean, I hated history classes in school, love history as a subject now though. So that's the difference. Yeah. What was one of the first things that you encountered or one of the first techniques that you encountered for specifically teaching history to that audience that that led you into the rest of the stuff that kind of triggered the rest? Yeah. So, like for example, one of the key tenets of Teach Like a Pirate is don't just teach a lesson, create an experience. Lessons are easily forgotten, but experiences live forever, right? So like you, they might forget some of that prohibition lecture that you give, but they'll never forget going to the speakeasy. So it's about taking the lessons that you teach, the content and saying like, here's my content, not good enough. How do I create an experience around this? How do I create, how do I make this memorable? How do I create a love of learning through this? And so like, if you come to my door and you walk in and you 
sit down at a desk in a straight row and I stand up in the front and I lecture you about prohibition and speakeasies, uh, that, that, that's a lesson. But if you come to my door and you find it locked and you have to knock to get in, and then when it slides open six inches, you see me standing there in a pinstripe gangster outfit and I'm asking you for a <laughs> password to get in. And if you don't know the password, you're not getting in unless you go find the password. And then when you do come in, you're immediately hit with 20s music, but it's too dark to see. And then you enter through a little curtain that wasn't there the day before and the whole room's been transformed and you recognize nothing and your eyes are just adjusting to the accent lights and then finally you think you might see a bar in the front and that could be a bartender up there you go up to the front you order a drink you get served a drink and then you go sit down on a table that's got some gambling items out on it that's an experience and so it's taking the content that we're teaching kids and boring kids with in general and wrapping experiences around them and, and creating adventures and things that are they're going to draw them again almost magically or mag- magnetically into what we're doing so when you do something like that, did you, in at least in your early days, did you encounter any pushback from the schools where they were like, what? You can't turn your classroom into a speakeasy. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, some of these wilder things I was doing originally, you know, actually administration was fairly supportive of it. Because if you think about what an administrator has on their plate to worry about, the idea that you, someone who's passionate about education, getting kids fired up about learning, fewer behavior problems reaching the front office because kids are ex- actually want to be in your class, mm-hmm. that you're going to wind up on their radar as a problem, uh, has, it doesn't ring true to me. It hasn't been my experience. There's been great support amongst administrators for Teach Like a Pirate um, because... Um, you know, they love to see that energy and that passion on their campus. So, uh, but I have seen pushback sometimes from other teachers. Huh. And, you know, one of the things that I tell teachers is, listen, if you create a class that becomes wildly popular with kids, that's not going to make everybody happy on your <laughs> campus. And especially if their class is not popular and they're going to seek reasons for maybe why your class is popular and theirs isn't. And they're not pro- probably not going to be self-reflective and empowering reasons. They're probably likely to be judgmental. So uh-huh. I have seen some pushback from other teachers to people that are teaching like a pirate. And and that sounds like it's jealousy more than anything or, or jealousy, or I don't know how to do that. And I imagine you are happy to teach them how to do that. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Or you know what? It's just plain lack of information because, you know, we work in this weird profession as teachers where, uh, you know, I've taught with some people for 17 years and never actually seen them teach a class. And they've never seen me teach a class because we're teaching at the same time. Right. Right. And so you just hear these bits of pieces and stories and things from kids and stuff like that. So sometimes it's just lack of information. And then they realize what's the the educational strategy um, behind what you're doing, then, you know, they buy in. Okay. Interesting. And some of the historical stuff, going back to speakeasies and things, the prohibition and things like that for a second, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, crime. There's a lot of uh, illegal stuff. There's a lot of sort of the dark side of life stuff in there. How do you bring that into a presentation like that? And pirates is a great example where we always have to think about, Okay, they were they were robbing and killing, but there were also reasons why they were robbing and killing and there's history to be learned out of that. How do you mix in the dark stuff so that uh, one, it's not traumatizing to the kids uh, two, uh, the parents don't freak out? Yeah. And so I think it's a it's just having a balanced approach when you talk about it. And I think Uh it's some of that dark stuff. um, You know, I I lead with it, actually. I, I use that as a hook, like one of the hooks of Teach Like a Pirate is the taboo hook and that we are naturally drawn by human nature. We're drawn to things which uh, maybe we're not supposed to hear about. Maybe things that are secretive or privileged information that they're going to get that no one else gets to hear or stuff that's um, maybe illicit or inappropriate, depending on the age that you teach, right? Human right. nature from adult, from the youngest child up to adults are drawn into that. And so we can tap into some of those, that those human nature ideas to create uh, presentations which, you know, just, just suck them in. And so I, I'm, I'm more than happy to lead with that stuff and, and, and use it. You know, we're, marketers use some of these same strategies to sell billions of dollars of products to our kids. And yeah. most of it's bad for them. We're selling something life transformational, which is education. So we can tap into some of their same principles to create schools that have kids running to get to us the same way they run to get to some of these products and services they see marketed so well. Has there ever been a time where you did get in trouble for something? Oh, I've been, I've been in trouble many times. <laughs> Absolutely. I knew I liked yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, I'm a definitely first name basis with some of my administrators. You know, like uh, the, uh, 
I, I've had, I, I always tell people when I'm doing my workshops, one of the things I'll tell them, I say, like, listen, I've had more disasters in my classroom than anyone sitting here. I'm not talking about lessons that weren't engaging. I've had some of those too. I'm talking disasters. Like I have been injured during lessons before. I have had kids, I've had students injured during lessons before. I've had to sit in my principal's office and explain why I thought it was a good idea to have an open propane tank flame raging in the classroom. Now to me, <laughs> it, to me, it made perfect sense that when we were telling those mountain man tall tales that we had written collaboratively using mountain man slang it was going to be way more engaging if we told them around a campfire roasting marshmallows but not everybody on my campus saw it like that <laughs> and so <laughs> I, I i had to accept the feedback from my administrators <laughs> and i still do that lesson but now i just moved it to a dirt overflow parking lot where there's nothing can catch fire right but nice. so yeah there's been several times where i've received um I, I put quote marks in the air feedback from administrators about some of the lessons <laughs> So when you're when you're training to teach your teachers to do this stuff, how do you put them at ease enough to try something like that when they're scared that they're going to get in trouble slash lose their job slash, you know, whatever in this modern age of, of go get them type of media? Yeah, absolutely. So I think that for one thing, it's a matter of educating the people that are around you and letting them know what is the pedagogy pedagogy behind what it is that you're doing. Mm -hmm. And again, when they see kids fired up in the classroom and loving school, uh, I think they're willing to be forgiven of a lot of stuff like parents, for example, who maybe have kids that they're having to force out the door and have battles to get them to school every day. And now their kid coming home and telling, say like, talking about all these stories that have happened at school and they can't wait to go the next day, they're willing to be pretty forgiving of some of these kind of a little more wild strategies. But the other thing I tell teachers is, listen, hey, all progress is found outside of your comfort zone. So like, mm -hmm. if you're never uncomfortable, then you're not growing. And we talk to kids about that all the time. We say, we tell them we have to have a growth mindset. And they say, well, I'm not good at math. And we say, oh, no, wait, 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 wait. You're not good at math yet, right? And But as teachers, as educators, we have to shine that same light towards ourselves and say, listen, maybe this is going to be a little uncomfortable for me, but yet that's where... That's where progress is found, and so it's it's willing to it's being willing to push into some of that um, uncomfortableness and, and to do it anyway, and that's and that's very much the pirate spirit. Certainly, yeah, and which leads into my next question: When you're uh, designing all this stuff, at what point in your process of being a teacher did you think, okay, this now I've got a collection of tools that I can offer to the world, and then why pirates? Why did you de decide to theme it around pirates? Outside of what you've already told me. Yeah, so I signed up to do a workshop for the peers in my district several years ago. And I, I drove away from that meeting going like, oh my God, what have I just done? I don't have a workshop. I don't have any of this organized in any way. And so I got relentless about writing down everything I did in my classroom that I thought was successful. But then that wasn't good enough because that's what I do. I had to take it a step back further and try to come up with where did these ideas come from to begin with? Why does this one work and why doesn't this work? And so I collected all these things. And uh, then I wanted to have a theme. I wanted to be able to model and demonstrate some of the ideas that I was doing in my classroom. I wanted to do those things in the in the in the seminar so that teachers could feel what it was like to be drawn in and to be hooked. And so I wanted to have a theme. I call it putting handles on material to make it easier for people to pick up. Like with my content in school, I want to put handles on my content to make it easier for kids to pick up and take with them. Well, I wanted to put handles on this workshop. I wanted to have a way of talking about it, create a language around it and a community. And so pirates appeal to me again because the pirates are this the kind of little rebellious they're outside the mainstream. They're rejecting the status quo and they're disruptive. And I thought that that's exactly what we need in education right now. It's based on an outdated model. And when you see something that's based on an outdated model, it's time to disrupt it. And so the pirate spirit is a very, I, I feel it's kind of a disruptive force. And so that appealed to me. And then when I, then the, the course, the hooks that I mentioned earlier, I, I'm abnormally obsessed with acronyms. First thing I did is I turned <laughs> the page sideways. I wrote P-I-R-A-T down the page. I knew I wanted to talk about passion and enthusiasm and there the P and the E were sitting at the beginning and the ends of the word and I knew I want to talk about building rapport with kids and relationships and sort of being the heart of teaching there the R was sitting in the center and so I never looked back I did it that summer and then began to go anywhere where anyone would listen to me to talk about this stuff and now you know there's a whole you know there's thousands and thousands of teachers around the world who identify themselves as pirates or edu pirates and you know we like Twitter social media is a great place where we connect there's a hashtag T 
T-L-A-P, for Teach Like a Pirate, TLAP. It's a worldwide community of educators coming together to talk about passion, creativity, engagement. Now, like when I go travel, do workshops, um, it's not unusual for some places I go, more than half of the people in the audience are dressed like pirates, sometimes even more than that. <laughs> um, I, did a, I did an event in the UK and uh, about 80 to 90 percent of the people there were dressed like pirates at the event and they had built a ship inside <laughs> of the uh, inside of the presentation area f- to be the stage that I would present on. And uh, they had a plank out front that you walked across a plank to get into the event. And, the, and, and you know, I just did an event up in Northern California and they had a pirate ship parked outside. They contracted with someone who does, uh, you know, takes pirate ships to parties and things like that. Had a pirate uh-huh. ship outside for photos and pictures. And so it's this brand which has been fun and easy to spread and to talk about in a, in a way of building a community. You know, like they'll, they have a way of decorating and setting their room. There's treasure chests. There's coins on the table. There's, uh, ba- you know, you see them passing out bandanas as teachers are coming in and so it's created this whole fun way of connecting and building a community of like like-minded educators who want to do something a little different so the the pirate theme and brand has just been absolute complete gold that's interesting when uh it, it all sounds uh speaking both as a teacher and as a student it Sounds fantastic all the way across you. And and I can imagine most teachers going, yes, I would love to do that. But either I don't have the time to put stuff together like that, or I don't even know where to begin. So what is the, what's like a first step that a teacher can take to move in that direction of what you're doing? Yeah. Well, so, so first of all, the time factor, some, some of these things do take a lot of time, but when you see the kids light up, after you do it, it kind of, it makes it worth it. Like one of the things I uh-huh. tell people is say like, it's, uh, it's not supposed to be easy. It's supposed to be worth it. And right. so when you do these things and you see them and you see them light up, it, it, it's worth it. But then a lot of these things can, can be added around the edges of what you do. So it's not necessarily that you're spending more, like, what do you say the day before, uh, that gets kids anticipating and desperate to come in the next day? What do you have in the room that as soon as they walk in the room, they're like, Oh my God, what is that? Like, what are we doing? doing today and so it's about building up mystery curiosity buzz I, and teach like a pirate language we call it preheating the grill and so here's the <laughs> thing like i don't put my steak on a cold grill i preheat my <laughs> grill like when you drop your steak on a cold grill nothing happens but when you drop your steak on a preheated grill what happens sizzle it sizzles. Well, see, I want my content to sizzle when I drop it. So I always preheat the grill, building up mystery, curiosity, buzz, anticipation. So some of these things like that, it's a mindset and a way of looking at your content. How can I get them excited about what's coming? How can I put them on the edge of their seat to see something that I wanted to show them all, the, all along anyway? And so it's kind of a mindset and a way of looking at the world and saying, how can I use that? Like you look around the world and say, what are other people engaged with? And what, are, what is, and how can I use that? What are other professions using to engage in their line of work? How can I use that in my line of work? What are kids into outside of school? How can I use that inside of school? And so it's just a mindset, a way of looking at the world and always saying, how can I use that to better engage and to draw my kids in? Okay. So if you were going to give a a teacher like, here's something you could do tomorrow that is a small step in that direction. Is there, is there like a first step? Yeah, well, so there's a wide variety. I mean, there's over 30 hooks that are in the book and 170 okay. different brainstorming questions. Okay. But like, for example, um, you know, it's what are you going to tell them that's going to make them want to come in the next day and, and find out what the heck you're talking about? What Maybe you have a box. And what, 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 what if they walked into class and there was a three-dimensional object covered with tarp in the center of the room with mm-hmm. crime scene tape around it? <laughs> right? <laughs> Do you think there's going to be some curiosity and some interest about what's underneath this tarp, tarp and why sure. there's crime scene tape around? Absolutely. And the kids come and ask questions, just sit down. We're going to deal with that. This is, And they, they sit down around it. And then can you imagine the intensity of engagement when you go over and pull the tarp up and show what's underneath it? Right. Like, see, that's, that's not taking a lot of extra time. It's just a way of of crafting 
your presentation, like I, I kind of look at it as a triple Venn diagram. Mm -hmm. uh, teaching is a triple Venn diagram. You've got uh, one circle is content. Hey, we have to have that circle or we're just entertainers or babysitters. Sure. So as teachers, we have to have that circle. But there's all sorts of ways you can learn your content, right? There's books, there's conferences you can go to, professional development, online. There's lots of ways you can learn content. Then there's this, this second circle that interlocks with that. I call it techniques and methods. As teachers, we have this whole toolbox of techniques and methods that we've garnered from our training and uh, credential programs and conferences and things like that. But then there's this third circle that nobody's talking about, right? And that third circle is what I label presentation. So yeah, you know your content. Yeah, you got all these techniques and methods, but now how are you going to present it in such a way that it's engaging for kids? How are you going to present it in such a way that it's relevant for them? How are you going to present it in such a way that it draws them in like that magic and magnetic way, that hypnotic way? That's the third circle of Teach Like a Pirate. So yeah, we're going to teach all this, all these things, but now how are we going to craft it and present it so that it's, that, so that it's, uh, so it's wildly engaging for them. Okay. Interesting. Uh, to switch gears for just a second into something that would be, uh, applicable to a lot of my listeners. Like I said, I, I, there's a lot of, uh, reenactment style educators working. And a lot of it is storytelling. It sounds like, and, yeah. and the skill of storytelling is super important across the board, but especially with historical stuff. What would you tell somebody to do if they've got, one interaction with somebody. So we're at a, a festival. Somebody walks up to your display that's got cannons and sails and ships and things like that. What kind of things can somebody do in a one-time interaction to really help engage immediately? Yeah, so I think that uh, I think you're absolutely right. The storytelling is the key to most of this. And I think that a lot of it is like, so we want richness. Like we want... Uh, costuming we want mm -hmm. in, uh, i call it the the interior design hook what what have you done to the environment around you how have you incorporated props how have you built dr the dramatic build intention that is a part of something so i would craft some sort of line some sort of question possibly that you would ask or or, or maybe present an item for them that they have that the, that's just begs the, for the next question. So you want to spark an interaction. You want to have a conversation piece. In other words, as a part of uh, what you're doing when you're when you're acting with someone, and so that, that all, they can't see it and not want to know some more about it. So mm -hmm. I would be I would be constantly looking for conversation pieces. You know whether it's uh, unbelievably like an unusual coin or whatever it might be, and, and that they're they're just drawn in and they say, hey, like. What, what is that? Tell me more about that. And so it's always looking for that way that's going to spark a conversation and create a buzz. I, I wear the Teach Like a Pirate shirt everywhere I go. And um, I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with people, strangers, who are not strangers five minutes later because they're drawn in. They want to right. teach like a pirate. What, what, what does that mean? What is that all about? Right. And then boom. That's my entry point And I'm going to have a conversation with them. And um, so I, I think I think that's one of the key points. Interesting. And it, it kind of reminds me of I had a mentor in the music industry years ago, and one of his uh, uh, ideas for us was to never be exactly what people expect us to be, to always sow a little bit of confusion into the first interaction so that people have a question that they need answered so that they're, they're yeah. a little bit confused and off their game at the beginning. And then they're curious enough to ask you more about what you do. Uh, for for us, it was always when somebody goes, "What kind of music do you play?" Don't just go rock, because then the conversation's over, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But then to to make it vague enough where they have to ask you, "Well, what does that mean?" And is that kind of it's the like same a, thing? It's like a yeah, it's like a pattern interrupt. Mm -hmm. And so they have a they're coming to you with a preconceived notion of what this interaction is going to be. And so if you can interrupt that pattern, um, then you're immediately, that, that's immediately engaging for someone. Intriguing. Yeah. That's really cool. And if you think about it in the classroom setting, um, students have a very preconceived notion based on years of schooling, uh, what a classroom looks like, what, a, mm -hmm. what the interaction between with the teacher looks like, what lessons yeah. look like. And so it's in, it, again, it's interrupting that pattern. They come in and they see something completely outside of the norm, uh, of what they're, they're used to experiencing at school. And, uh, one of the things that I tell, uh, th this is the way that the quote I use, I say, provide an uncommon experience for your students and they will reward you with an uncommon effort and attitude. And so I think that's the same with historical interactors or people that are meeting with people at booths. You provide an uncommon experience for them 
in that interaction that's different than they're going to get in any other booth that they stop at, any other interaction they're going to see, they're going to provide you with an uncommon interest in level of engagement. Mm, yeah, definitely. We obviously have a broken education system in this in this country, and uh, both coming at it from the way that I was taught and just seeing how our test scores are through the floor and we're, you know, we're eighth and whatever. Can you point to some specific statistics from teaching your program that administrators would like to see where they go, yeah, but are the test scores higher? Are the grades higher? That type of thing. Or does it center around more of just an enthusiasm and being there? I think it's a little bit of both. And so one of the things, so test scores, first of all, um, you know, I, I rant quite often about the overemphasis on standardized test scores right? and that they're not a true measure of what is most important about what we're doing in school. Yep. And, um, you know, like just like, like a quick example, when I'm doing my civil rights unit for with my students, uh, what is more important to me that they can list uh, every single part of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 or that they are less likely to be racist and that they'll stand up to injustice when they see it around them in the world? Right. Well, that latter thing is what I want. Right. And but that's not what's on the test. The pieces right. <laughs> of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 are on the test. And so the test doesn't really measure what is most important about learning. And uh, so we are, it's not just about raising test scores. It's about raising human potential. Like yeah. we're in the life-changing business. And so uh, I, I rail about the test. But then the, here's the thing. It always goes, it still comes back to engagement because it doesn't matter what you say if nobody's listening. Right. And so you can teach to the test and do all these all you want. But if nobody's listening, it still doesn't matter. And so I always think that even though it seems uh, counterintuitive, worrying about powerful learning experiences first is going to always help with the, the test in the long run anyway. That's interesting. Do you find that the, the, the dates and numbers and things stick better after the experience? Absolutely. That's I mean, because it's, they're, they're drawn in. And, um, yeah, so I, I don't think, I don't think there's any question in that the, the, the test scores are going to rise when you increase the engagement level in your class. And then the other thing I think with education today is what we're learning is that it's not just about, um, see, it used to be that the gatekeeper in the world was information. Uh -huh. Who's got information? Who doesn't have information? But now, hey, everybody's got all the information. Right. Every, any kid can pull up anything on their phone in like five seconds. It's unbelievable yeah. how fast they are, right? So that's not the gatekeeper anymore. Now the gatekeeper is what can you do? What can you make? What can you create? What can you design? What can you code, right? And so we want, we're not just trying to put better trivial pursuit players out into the world. We want kids that can go out and do stuff and make stuff. So we want makers, not memorizers, creators, not consumers. Right. And so so I want to try to have that creative component, that making component, that design component to as many lessons as possible. So I think we need to empower kids, not just not just have them learn a bunch of facts they can spit out, uh, but we want to empower them to, to take information and do stuff with it. So then what do you think it will take to significantly improve the education system in this country? Because you, there's no way, does that have to come from a pirate revolution of teachers from the bottom up? Because I can't ever see the government sort of mandating that kind of creativity in a teaching context. I think it's, I think that's exactly what needs to happen is it's just from the bottom up. It's absolutely, it's a, uh, it's a revolution and um, you might not be able to change the whole system, but you can change your classroom. You know, you can, you can close the doors and you can change your classroom and then you can share, you can become a prolific sharer and a spreader of messages. And so that's like one of, you know, one of the key pieces of teach like a pirate success has been, you know, my background as an entrepreneur and a marketer and my ability to spread the message and to draw people in to build communities around things. And so, uh, like I tell people, I tell our authors, you know, we have, a, you know, like I said, we have over 40 books that we publish, different authors. Mm -hmm. I tell them all the time, hey, don't try to go sell your book. If you try to sell your book, you're going to feel icky like you're giving a sales pitch and nobody <laughs> likes to do that. And uh -huh. the other person's going to be resistant to your message because they think they're, they're trying to sell them something. So rather than trying to go sell your book, just try to go spread your message. That's why you came to us. You had a 
message you wanted to spread. So just focus on spreading your message. Build a community around that message. Be an authentic member of that community. Be a prolific sharer in that community. And then the wonderful thing about the universe is that books will sell too. And so there's this great spirit of reciprocity in the universe. And that when you help other people and build communities, those communities turn around and support you. I think this is something that you're experiencing in the, with the pirate community, right? Yeah. And so you are building a community around this, around your podcast, around your message, and you're traveling, you're speaking, doing these different things. And then that community turns around and supports you. And so that's one of the great things about the world today is our ability to connect with like-minded people, to build a, to find our tribe or in the pirate community, we call it our crew. And so we're looking to try to build our crew of educational pirates. And, uh, and, and so now we can connect and find people all over and, and build those communities. And, uh, and it's, a, it's not a matter of trying to sell something. It's a matter of, uh, of being an actual member of the community. And, and, and that's the key. Fantastic. I, I like all of it. Do you do any work at the uh, the college level certification level for teachers? I do all sorts of stuff. Uh, the Teach Like a Pirate is used as a textbook in many educational programs right now. Okay. And I love to come in. I Skype, do Google Hangouts and things like that with education departments. Uh, sometimes do events on college campuses for the education students and for the teachers, the local teachers in the area. And so, yeah, I'm doing more and more work in the uh, ed system at the higher ed level. That's fantastic. Well, great. Great, Dave. This has been fantastic, uh, and I know I have I have teachers in the audience who are probably excited to go find your stuff now. Where's the best place to keep up with you online? Yeah, so I'm at daveburgess.com. B U R G E S S. You can also find the whole business at daveburgessconsulting.com, and on Twitter, I live there. I am at Burgess Dave. So my name just flipped around to Burgess Dave. And again, the hashtag, which is sort of like the mothership of the whole thing, is T-L-A-P for Teach Like a Pirate. We have offshoot hashtags for our other pirate books like Lead Like a Pirate, Explore Like a Pirate, Play Like a Pirate, uh, Learn Like a Pirate, and things like that. But uh, the, the mothership hashtag is T-L-A-P. I'm at Burgess Dave. Fantastic, Dave. This has been really fun. I'm glad we got a chance to do this because uh, I was intrigued by the concept just looking at your website. So this has been cool, man. Hey, I really appreciate you having me on the show. I love what you're doing. And uh, thanks so much. And there it is, friends. That is my interview with Dave Burgess from Talk Like a Pirate. You can find out more about what he's up to at DaveBurgess.com. Dave, spelled like Dave. Burgess, B-U-R-G-E-S-S, DaveBurgess.com. Did you like the episode? Uh, I would love to hear what you liked about the episode. Did you learn something? I would love to hear what you learned from the episode. Come join us over on Facebook.com uh, slash Under the Crossbones or hit me on Twitter at Under Crossbones. Just shoot me a little note uh, or a little post or something. Go, hey, I like this part uh, or I didn't like that part or I learned this thing or whatever. I just want to hear what you think of the episode and that would be awesome. Now, we are doing a contest yeah, a little raffly, raffly, raffly. Uh, we're going to give away two signed copies of Dave's book, Teach Like a Pirate, uh, that you can get. And uh, all you have to do, go to the show notes at underthecrossbones.com slash 139, and there will be an entry form right there and a couple different ways that you can get entries. So, again, we're giving away two signed copies of Teach Like a Pirate, autographed by Dave Burgess himself, and uh, go to underthecrossbones.com slash 139. Look at the little entry form there, and you can win one for yourself. Uh, that contest ends May 22nd, so make sure you get over there and do that. We're sponsored today, of course, by Pirate Radio of the Treasure Coast, WKKC-DB, playing the best music in today's hits and yesterday's classics, and Pirate Radio Talk, playing the best pirate shows, including Under the Crossbones, 24-7, commercial free to listen just go to pirate radio with the treasure coast.com that's the music station you can also get the app for the music station which is pirate radio wkkc db or if you like the talk stuff go to pirate radio tc.com or get pirate radio talk for the app all brought to you by i treasure radio the very best digital media from independently owned stations i treasure media oops i treasure radio.com i should get that right i treasure radio there it is. I got a free ebook for you. It's Alexander Squelman's Pirates of Panama or Buccaneers of America, whichever title you prefer, because it's out there under both. And if you haven't read it, Cool book, man. This first came out in 1678. Alexander Squemlin was a doctor who ended up on a bunch of pirate ships and wrote about his adventures with the pirates. So this is firsthand, golden age kind of stuff right there. Uh, 
early golden age, 1678. Yeah, right in there. So to get that, go to underthecrossbones.com, click on the free ebook button, and you can grab it right there. Or if you're out and about, just text with your phone the word pirate and your email address to 94253. Grab your little phone, and grab your little texty thumb, and text the word pirate and your email address to 94253. That'll kick you back a link to download Buccaneers of America or Pirates of Panama. Or we're going to make up a third title for it that has absolutely nothing to do with it because, hey, why not? We'll call it uh, Pirates of Buccaneers of America of Panama. How about that? I like that one. That's good. And that's our show for today, friends. Thank you once again for tuning in. I always, always appreciate it. If you want to find out more about Dave Burgess and Teach Like a Pirate, go to DaveBurgess.com. Burgess, B-U-R-G-E-S-S. Dave Black Dave. You don't know how to spell Dave. and You obviously don't have a friend named Dave, and you should. Everybody should have a friend named Dave. I have at least one. He's my pal. (laughs) <laughs> Go to DaveBurgess.com and check out the book. And, of course, we are giving away two signed copies of Teach Like a Pirate. To do that, just go hit the show notes under the crossbones.com slash 139, and you'll see the entry form right there to win yourself an autographed copy, Teach Like a Pirate. And that contest ends May 22nd, so don't wait. Jump on it now. We got lots of great episodes coming up. Next week, Daniel Redman and Steve Bush from Ahoy There Podcast. Yeah, that is an improvised comedy pirate podcast, and it's fun, and uh, those guys are fun. So we're going to talk all about pirates and improv. It's all good. Uh, The week after that, Rich Manick from Captain Festus McBoyle's Travel and Variety Show, all the way from New Zealand. Yeah, we got some creative people coming on. This is going to be great. And uh, also after that, Robin Flanagan from Crimson Pirates and Chris Liedenfrost from greatest pirate story never told yeah more improvised pirates man we got some super creative people coming on the show here and uh i'm excited for you to hear all these great talks that i've recorded so uh it's gonna be fantastic i will see you next week with dan redmond and steve bush until then uh, sign off <laughs>